Hey, Living listen, a missed leader is as powerful as a present one. Mm-hmm. You gonna take him from his people? You don't think them people, 60,000 people ain't gonna miss him? Oh, they gonna be waiting. What? Even more then? Mm-hmm. Y'all just made him more famous. Yes, and then they done had <laughs> children man. by then, so they what? telling their children about it. Oh, bro, he in the books. That 60,000 about to be 120,000. Facts. What's good, y'all? It's the Do Machettes React, and we're back with another video. Who we got today, see? Today, we're back with another American reaction. Let's Super get it. excited about this video. Mm -hmm. If you're new to us, and, and we're new, new to you, you, make sure you scroll down, hit, hit that, that subscribe button, button, and turn on the post notification bell because we're on the road to 200k. And we cannot get there without you guys. All right, join the family. Without further ado, let's get into the video. Let's see it. In the dawning hours of the 21st of March 1960, Robert Mangalisa Sabukwa left his home in Mafola Soweto and began the five kilometer walk to the Orlando police station. In so doing, he was personally putting into action his nationwide call for a decisive non violent campaign against the past laws. As president of the Pan Africanist Congress, Sabukwe had called on all black South Africans on this day to leave their passbooks at home, walk to the nearest police station, and demand arrest. I remember it very well. I took him as far as Chabalala supermarket store and continued to my clinic. It was not far from Mfulu. I went there on foot and they left for Orlando police station. When we came to Colorado police station, so we said, this is the core of my man. That's why evening when we come to them, we told them that we surrender for arrest too, because we can no longer keep the bus. We have had it enough, enough is enough. I was there at Orlando police station and Sabukwe went inside and knocked on the door of the officer commanding. I heard at a place called Bofalong, the police had opened fire and it was thought that at least two people had been killed. And I went across and told Sabukwe and he was profoundly disturbed by this. He had, remember, sent a letter on the Friday to the commissioner of police to tell him about the coming campaign and to ask him to ensure that the police remained non-violent. Wow. Heeding Sabukwe's call, Black South Africans presented themselves for arrest at I police. Mean, people actually sent a, a letter before protesting. Right. Just to confirm that nothing is going to happen to our people as we're doing the call. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's different. It was he, organized. He was yeah, he was definitely moving you different. Know, it was organized, but he gave me a little bit of milk mix. I mean, he's, <laughs> hey, it's definitely giving historic. Like, dude, yeah. I hope you got a book out. If you do, y'all got to let me know about it. Yes, it's giving me a little bit of mm -hmm. Malcolm X. Okay. Definitely. I see the resembles. Okay. Stations countrywide in their thousands. I got to the shop pole, and we got into this crowd. The police evidence afterwards of this threatening crowd, uh, it just wasn't true, because I was in the thick of that crowd. And once they knew us from the Randani Mail, all that people wanted to do was to tell me their grievances, and suddenly the shots began. And in the evening, we read in the papers about Sharpville massacre. They were really sad. It really broke their hearts. For Robert Sabukwe, the 21st of March 1960 began as any other day. By nightfall, his actions had determined the course of history in South Africa. 69 people died in the hail of police gunfire at Sharpville that day. For what? I gotta say that though, and that's what, for, for what? what? Because when you're a leader and you're leading a bunch of people, you don't want nobody to get hurt. Exactly. I think that is the main reason, like the main thought process, the main, you know, idea of a, of a march. It's like, y'all come with me, y'all being protected, nothing's mm -hmm. gonna happen. That's why the letter was sent out. Mm -hmm. But yet they still didn't abide by it. And they said, you know what? We're gonna cross all lines. And, and they were not violent. They were not threatening. They even have their allies to testify for it. It, gets, it just goes to show the time that they were in. You know, and that's why South African history is it, kind of like hearing our history for the first time. Like when I was in school and, you know, um, at home when my family was telling me our history in the country. It's, it's like that shock factor hearing it all over again and just seeing the dates and how... 
our people were fighting the same fight. It, yeah. It's just... There's a lot of similarities as well, too. Why is violence the first call to action to disperse in the crowd? Like, I mean, I, I mean that's, that's what it was, too, because we have it to where it's me. like, you know what I'm saying, it's, they use a fear tactic to try to de-escalate people and make people, you know, listen and say, you know, yeah. whatever they say we y'all do, this is what y'all do because if we don't, this is what they're going to do. But even then, that probably wasn't even a, a real move. Like, it wasn't a motion to them for make them stop. You know what right. I'm saying? It wasn't going to stop just because they started opening fire, which is hella wrong right. at the they, end of the they, day. They but asked to be, they presented themselves to be arrested. Yeah, yeah. Shooting reverberated around the world and emblazoned That's indelibly crazy. the profile of apartheid oppression on the consciousness of the international community. Caught off guard, the regime was now fully aware of Sabuku's enormous influence and power. He was imprisoned for three years. Determined to neutralize his influence on the eve of his release three years later, the regime passed a bill through Parliament, the so-called Sabuku Clause which would enable his indefinite incarceration, as they put it, this side of eternity. Robert Mangalisa Sabukwe, the youngest of four surviving children, was born in the township of Umasizake, outside Hrafrenet on the 5th of December 1924. It was a hard and simple life. There was no electricity or running water, and the children slept on the floor. Sabuqua's mother, Angelina, had never been to school. His father, Hubert, forced by family circumstances to leave school after Standard 5, was passionately driven to ensure the education of his children. With his meager income, Sabuqua's father made sure that he brought books into the home and encouraged his children to read. Yep. Sabuqua attended primary school at the Umasizake Township Methodist Church Mission. With no secondary schooling available to blacks in Hrafrenet, Robert Sabuqua waited for two years before obtaining financial assistance to go to Heald Town, a Methodist educational institution near Fort Beaufort. He was the closest friend I had at school. Robert was a, a voracious reader. He was very keen on English literature, particularly poetry. I remember one that he really loved was uh, Gray's Elegy, full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air. Now he loved those two lines. Mm -hmm. And in the classics, he loved Charles Dickens, particularly A Tale of Two Cities. And uh, also favorite. he loved Baroness Oxy's uh, Scarlet Pimpernel. In biography, he preferred to read the biographies of the chaps in America because he felt that uh, this is where these people started fighting slavery, you know. Mm. He was that sort of man. He had a lot of empathy with other people. Very sensitive and uh, this sort of chap who would not tolerate injustice. He liked music and uh, he was also, curious enough, a Christian. I need to hear that. Started fighting slavery. Baroness Oxy's uh, Scarlet Pimpernel. In biography, he preferred to read the biographies of the chaps in America because he felt that uh, this is where these people started fighting slavery, you know. He was that... Whew, I, had to, I had to listen to that one again. I, I, I had to listen to that one again because this is a man in South Africa during the time of their oppression. During this time, well, no, this was during his school age. Yeah. Okay, so I would say what? He's still, he's 40s, still, he's 1940s? still fairly young. I can't put a year to it, but he's still fairly young. Yeah, so I want to say 1940s, 1950s, maybe, because that was 1960 when he did the march to the okay, police station. Okay, okay, so about okay. a 10 year gap between that. Yeah, yeah, 10, 15, 20, about there. Okay, so this is before the civil rights movement, and the fact that he read the biographies of the people in America. Yeah. And identifying that they shared struggle. The fight between that we our had. people. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that is what I wish people amongst the diaspora would do today. 
Oh yeah, I feel that. Other than the the ignorance of the back and forth, the we we're not the same people, you know. Like, let's get out the oppression Olympics, okay? And let's learn about each other. That's what it is. If they could do it back then. What's stopping us from doing it now? And I'm not speaking as a general because I know many of us learn about each other on and off camera. Um, but just speaking to the public, we have just a let's level, learn about each other. We have a level of freedom than what we had in, I mean, years, years, years ago. Right, right. Plus the fight that they had years, years, years ago. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it was a lot of things that could have stopped them then to make them focus strictly on their own behalf mm -hmm. of what's going on. But it was yeah. like, you know... Let me, let me do a little research here. Let me look deep yeah. into what's really going on around the world. And then you right. get to see the similarities of that. And you be like, yo. Yeah. Like, it helps you understand what it is you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. And this is even before the civil rights movement. You know, the 1960s is the civil rights movement. So, so what was he studying? The Harlem Renaissance. And that's mm -hmm. when our people were really, you know, redefining themselves. So. Yeah. I just wanted to make that statement. Sort of man. He had a lot of empathy with other people. Very sensitive and uh, this sort of chap who would not tolerate injustice. He liked music and uh, he was also, curious enough, a Christian. He loved church music particularly. And of course he and I loved the classics like Mozart, Brahms, that sort of thing. Robert was very articulate. His language was meticulous. He was really very well respected because the man was, even in those days, you know, you could see the potential of a leader in him. Near death with tuberculosis in his final year at Healdtown, Robert Sabukwe rallied to earn a first-class matric pass, which took him to the University of Fort Hare in 1947. Fort Hare was a crucible of intellectual engagement. The roots of Sabukwe's political philosophy are found in the issues of non-collaboration, pan-Africanism and African nationalism and the heated debate at the time. He was a founding member of the ANC Youth League at Fort Hare and in his final year he was unanimously elected as president of the SRC. On his graduation in 1949, Sabukwe had made his mark as orator and student leader. When I met him, he was already in politics. We met at the Victoria Hospital, I was trained there as a nurse. When I first saw him, I think my heart skipped a beat. It was love at first sight. After completing midwifery, I went to Fryhead, where I was working as a trained nurse. He was teaching in Standerton General High School. I used to write to him and tell him that I'm passing Standerton to Devon or Fryhead or Ladysmith. And he used to come there and meet me. At the Stanaton station, on my way to work, we got married in 1954 in Johannesburg. He was teaching at Wits University as a lecturer in, in Bantu languages. And I was enormously impressed when I heard him speak in meetings, because there was a strength about him. The Africanists were developing as a separate force, and he was clearly emerging as the leader of the Africanists. The communal hall in Orlando was the setting for the Watershed ANC conference in November 1958, which saw the Africanists part ways with the mother body. With the adoption of the Cliptown Charter in 1955, the Africanists were concerned that the ANC had discarded the 1949 Program of Action. They were also concerned that the direction and control of the movement was being manipulated by the Communist Party. The PAC was launched at the same venue the following year in April 1959. And by the end of the year, we were heading for the first national conference of the PAC in Orlando. It was at that conference that one of the most important decisions was taken okay. to challenge the past laws. Okay. I remember one single year, 1957, when as much as 368,000 Africans were arrested and charged under one aspect of the past laws. A thousand people and more per day, every day on the average, that is what it meant. And Sobukwe saw all this. 
he understood it. It was his people who were suffering. And At one point in history, I remember that um, getting locked up was a was the way to go. Right. Purposely. <laughs> Purposely. Like we're gonna pack it out, we're gonna flood it, and we're gonna make sure they got no more walls in there that we mm -hmm. can cover. And we can't put you can't put us in jail no more. Right. Like get, being, getting put in jail was the thing back in the day. Not to not to glorify being in jail, but I'm yeah. just saying how the stand for change was. Right. Yeah, we're gonna put put me in jail. That's the put me in jail. Lock right. me up. What else can you do? What else we gonna do other than like we're gonna do the same thing in there? We're doing on the streets. Y'all gonna hear us from each wall, from each side. Mm -hmm. That's how it was, and man. When we get out, we're gonna go right back in because we're doing Big the same. Thing. Yep. <laughs> that's All how right, y'all. Next week, same place. Same place, same time. Until Whatever. it changed. Yeah. That's how it was. The PAC took a decision at that Congress under Sobukwe's leadership that we are going to take final decisive action against the past laws. And powers were given to Sobukwe to call the nation as soon as possible. And we were amazed at the simplicity of the plan. Sobukwe decided that on a given day, a local branch of the PAC, under the local leadership, would move to the nearest police station and get to the police station and say to those in charge of the police station, look, here we are. <clears throat> we don't have our first. The whole idea was that uh, you had to give non-violence a chance. That was Sobukwe's mission. On Friday the 18th of March, Sabukwe announced that the moment had come. The decisive non-violent campaign demanding the abolition of the pass laws and a minimum wage for Africans would be launched in 72 hours. On the eve of March the 21st, Sabukwe attended his resignation to the University of the Witwatersrand. The following morning, Sabukwe put into practice his call to the nation. History took its course. Okay. Mm. So we didn't learn about South African history right. in school, but we did learn about Nelson Mandela as a biography profile. Yep, yep, yep. A lot of people did researches on him too. Right, Projects. right. They was really talking about him a lot. I never knew of this man. A lot of people, man, they were pretty probably don't know about this guy. And he's a movement. Yes, he's big. just listening to all the things he did, like. Mm -hmm. His story needs to be out there just as much, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? Everybody had a time for greatness and a time for call, and um, he definitely stood when it was time for him to go. Yeah, I feel like earlier I compared him to Malcolm X with, you know, just the Well, that movement with him going to the uh, to stations and standing there. Right, because Malcolm X was more of like a mm -hmm. cultural revolutionary. Um, Martin Luther King was more of political. You know, he, mm, he yeah. went from the head, he was going to the president mm -hmm. to try to make change, well, to make change, because he did make change for us. Um, Malcolm X was more along the streets. Yeah. And so that's what I see, but but now I'm starting to see a little bit both of him, both mm. of them in him, you know, especially with the nonviolence. So. I'm glad that he did it like that too with the nonviolence. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I got to understand what, why 69 people ended up, you know, losing their life. Correct, yeah. Under the PAC banner of service, sacrifice and suffering, and the strategy of no bail, no defense, no fine, the PAC leadership had placed themselves at the forefront of the campaign. Subukwe, initiator of the campaign, was arrested with 23 of the executive committee and held at the Johannesburg Fort, pending trial. So, Meanwhile, in the Western Cape, a week-long stay-away intensified the campaign. At Langa, police responded brutally, and history once more took its course. They moved into Langa. I think it was around 2 o'clock at night, and it was house to house beating up people. Now, on that morning of the 30th of March, here was a situation which was presenting itself, and the PAC, which was the initiator of the whole thing, decided that we are now not much into any police station. Hold on, question. Was he, do, I, I, I don't know, like, was he locked up with the other 23 people? Yeah, he was one of the Whenever they, and then they started to shoot? Maybe because earlier the man said that he went to him and told, told him about the shootings. Mm. And it devastated him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But marching straight to parliament. Oh, and we let this come past Mowbray Station. 
up the Val Drive, past through the skier, skating table mountains, down into the street that goes straight into Parliament. By the time we reached town, the town was already filled with curious, interested people who just wanted to see what's going on. Unaware that the minister, F.C. Irasma, had given the commissioner of the police for the Western Cape orders that we have to be shot that morning. And Parliament was sitting, and if Hosanna had lifted his little finger, that city could have been sacked that day, and they knew it. The government was in a state of absolute fear that day. And I'm telling you, we were fear. damn determined. <laughs> For and all protests. that we wanted to talk to the commissioner of the police was that he should set up an appointment with Mr. F.C. Erasmus, the Minister of Justice. It's well, not about us being violent that makes them afraid. It's numbers. Mm -hmm. Because how is it that a, you, you, I mean, it's a letter in the mail that say, hey, we ain't coming for trouble. We got something to say. Right. As a matter of fact, we all got something to say. Right. And you have a post that says, it's going around town saying, hey, this is a non-violent protest. Mm -hmm. And then when you get there, they see how many people actually feel the same way. And your order is to be violent to those people that doesn't want to cause any harm. <sighs> That's crazy to me, yo. And it, it's it, crazy. And it's not, it's not rubber bullets. It, it's shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. And all that we wanted to talk to the commissioner of the police was that he should set up an appointment with Mr. F.C. Erasmus, the Minister of Justice. Well, they realized they can't move this crowd of 60,000 crammed into the city of Cape Town. 60,000. After 30 minutes, they came back to say, Mr. Kotsala, the minister has agreed to meet you this afternoon. Could you please remove this crowd from the city? Oh, no, let's meet right now, sir. I want to believe that so uh, sometimes little miracles do happen and that our people could stand inside the city of Cape Town for at least something like two hours without touching a glass or breaking anything. Mm. I asked for the police loudspeaker and no, just fine. to tell the people That's that we have right secured an appointment with. with the minister. And I reminded them what Sobukwe had said. When you have reached an agreement with... 60,000 people and they were non-violent. 60,000, y'all. Non-violent. 60,000. We could do 60,000 in one. <laughs> <laughs> and not be about now. I'm just saying yeah. because a lot of protesters does go around the world, and people want their voices heard, and that's all that is. That's nothing right. more to it. That's I think at the end of the day, that's beautiful. I think they did it very well, like you said, it was organized. Anything that's organized deserves an applause. For yes, real. you know, wasn't chaotic. You know, I study history a lot, and I've always studied history. I've always been a history buff, and when I look back on you know people fighting oppression mm -hmm. and fighting for rights and things like that even with the women's suffrage here um, they always start off nonviolent mm. until provoked that is a fact you know so there's power in numbers you know when we just gotta keep on going and I think he understood that yeah that is power in numbers 60,000 y'all that ain't no that ain't no little 000. number in Cape Town Sixty thousand. <laughs> I didn't hear about this. <laughs> and, and nobody was violent. Nobody. He couldn't move the crowd. Right. He we was gonna stay it. there till you came outside, sir. Come on. Mm. Police just obey what the police say, and that whole crowd looked back. And I knew that that appointment really meant nothing except now that I was going to go with a small group of people who just belonged. Philip Cosana was detained on that historic afternoon of the 30th of March, 1960. And whilst on bail, left South Africa for 36 years in exile. In the wake of March 1960, the PAC and ANC were banned, and thousands of South Africans were arrested and jailed. Robert Sabukwe was sentenced on the 4th of May 1960 to three years hard labor. Your worship, he said from the dock, we believe in one race only, the human race to which we all belong. The history of that race is a long struggle, and we would have betrayed the human race if we had not done our share. We stand for equal rights for all individuals oh. and are not afraid of the consequences. Mm. Subukwe, having served his three-year sentence, now due for release, the apartheid government so feared his influence they implemented their Subukwe clause. This clause enabled them to detain Sabukwe indefinitely. 
On the 23rd of April 1963, Sabukwe was secretly flown to Robben Island, where he was incarcerated in isolation. The state then extended this incarceration a year at a time up until 1969. Play with that boy Tom. I only knew him. Play with that man Tom. All because he had influence, yeah. This is yes, what influence do to you. Influence would have you locked up that's for what a mean. long time. I know. Sometimes I begin scared of things we be talking about on this channel. Girl, stop. <laughs> uh, ain't none of that. But it's crazy because, like, you have this power for change. And because it's so possible... And the people in the rest until they get what they want. You try right. to ask out the leader who created the whole movement. Right. I mean, but still, it's, at the end of the day, I know, I know, a, a letter can still make noise, a, a phone call can still make noise. At the end of the day, never giving up is gonna make noise and it's mm -hmm. gonna make change. But it's just, mm, I lost my thought. Mm. It's sad. They extended his sentence each year, purposely for the rest of his life. Well, they say he got out in 1969, but the claws cool. say he definitely. Yeah. That's, hold on, in isolation. The state then extended this incarceration a year at a time up until 1969. I only knew him starting when we went to visit him at uh, Robben Island. At the time, I didn't know whom we were going to visit. I didn't know that I had a father for that matter. Wow. I think I was around six. We we'll stayed together with him for the entire two weeks, spending mornings, afternoons, and evenings confined inside that, uh, that place of his. There was no living soul nearby around him. He was kept under solitary confinement for the duration of his stay there. If that's not suffering, I don't know how would you term that. I was just happy when I was around him, even though we didn't talk much. We didn't talk much. He was a person who never complained. He just accepted everything. We were just proud of him. Benji was a great friend of my husband. In fact, he was just like a brother to him. He supported him spiritually. And as he came to see us almost every month, he was very supportive. Once he was on the island, I applied for permission to go and see him and we had six days together. We'd go to an interview room and we'd sit at a table all day long, talking. It was clear he hadn't changed. He was as determined, as certain as ever, about where he'd been and where he wanted to go. We had what was told us, the only leader is here, and then we were very anxious to see him. The following day when we'd taken to work, we were pulling bamboo out of the sea. We passed that house and we saw him, we knew him, it was he took up the ground and, uh, and, and, and spread it for us. And then we saluted him, our salute. And then we were sure that it was him. Mm. Hey, the listen, a missed leader is as powerful as a present one. Mm -hmm. You gonna take him from his people? You don't think them people, 60,000 people ain't gonna miss him? Oh, they gonna be waiting. What? Even more then? Mm -hmm. Y'all made them more famous. Yes, and then they done had <laughs> on, children man. by then, so they telling their children about it. Oh, him. bro, he in the books. That 60,000 about to be 120,000. Facts. A bit difficult because he never knew when breakfast was being brought to him. So it might be at 6 in the morning, might be at 7, might be at 8 in the morning. So you can never be sure when his day was starting. But he would have his breakfast. He liked to listen to the religious program on the SABC uh, every morning. And he would settle down to work. He was doing a university degree, did several degrees on, on the island. And he would read and listen to music and pass the day as constructively as possible. He fought against a despair, obviously. What eventually happened, he'd been on the island for six years in these quite terrible circumstances, never knowing when he was going to come out, could have gone on indefinitely. And it began to erode him. And there was clearly something wrong. And I think the government suddenly realized that they had a problem on their hands. And they dumped him, quick as a flash. Put him into banishment in Kimberley. Solitary confinement is not good for the, for the mind. It is not good, like for it may not affect him for maybe the first couple months to a year. Mm -hmm. But after that, 
You start, to start you like you start questioning things because it's like what's real at this point. Right. You mm. think being institutionalized is bad. Go talk to a person who has been on solitary confinement. Mm. It's sad. You may not even recognize that person. Mm. Banished to the township of Khalishiwe, outside Kimberley on the 14th of May 1969, under house arrest and constant surveillance, Sabukwe was able to establish roots, settle down with his family and study law. In 1975 he was admitted to the bar and established a thriving legal practice. Despite the stringent terms of banishment and the incapacitating fear and intimidation that permeated South African society, Sabukwe continued to articulate his beliefs. His engagement with members of the South African student organization with whom he formed lasting friendships influenced the nascent black consciousness movement. In Kimberley, we used to sit and talk 50 feet away. The security police would be in their car, just sitting there watching us all the time. The late Steve Biko uh, contravened these bannings uh, possibly once, perhaps twice, to go across country to see Sabukwe, and that would have been an illegal meeting. He wasn't trying to arouse the population, but his presence was important there. The mere fact that he was there and people knew he was there contributed to the politicization of the community in Galashewe. Paul Malume was modest. He was a humble man. There are a lot of good things we picked up from him. When he was off duty, he looked so handsome in his khaki attire. Working in his garden, we used to stand up and marvel at this wonderful, but what type of a man is this? <laughs> such a well-learned man, such a brave man, but oh, so humble. Oh, he would come home in the afternoons from court. Our, our shoe store was across the road from the magistrate court, and he'd find a woman crossing the road, and he'd get hold of a bag of potatoes, whatever parcel she was carrying, sling it over his shoulder with his briefcase in one hand and his gown over the other arm and he'd help her across the road. That was Robert. The phrase that always resounded in my mind when I would think of him was the one from Chaucer, a gentle path at night. This enormously gentle, courteous person, we'd walk through the streets of Kimberley and there were always greetings for him, and he would politely greet everyone. Didn't matter who they were, he would greet them. He never accepted that he was dying. And my wife Anne and I went down, and we spent a Saturday with him in his room, and we talked quietly, and then he'd sleep again. And he. Okay, so was he dying from the tuberculosis? He did mention that earlier, I believe. Okay. All right, at the very beginning of this documentary. So so during that time, not only was he in solitary confinement, they wasn't getting him any medical help? I can only imagine what he was suffering with. Oh, my God. And he told me he didn't believe he was going to die, that he had a destiny to fulfill, and God would ensure that he fulfilled that destiny. And um, by the end of the day, he was a lot better, but less than a week later, oh. at about 2 in the morning, Veronica phoned me. So he died. He was a very humble man. People used to love him. And I can't say it's because he was intelligent. He used to tell me that don't say so much about your husband, Zoto. <laughs> so I won't say too much about him. I won't praise him now. The people will praise him, not me. Aww. It was as if there was a dark cloud in Kimberley. All of us. We're asking God, why now? When we thought, here comes light for Kimberley, then all of a sudden, it was dim. A lot of people prepared Malume's funeral, but I tell you, it was painful. The whole of Kimberley went over to Hrafreinit. Throughout his life, Sabukwe held the unshakable belief that in his lifetime, South Africa would be part of a liberated, united Africa. This is the cause to which he committed his life. He was not able to witness his oft-stated dream of South Africa's youth walking tall in a country they call their own. On the 27th of February 1978, Robert Sabukwe, at the age of 53, died of lung cancer. Sabukwe once wrote, 
True leadership demands complete subjugation of self, absolute honesty, integrity and uprightness of character, yes. courage and fearlessness, and above all, a consuming love for one's people. Tragically, South Africa has been denied the contribution of Robert Mangaliso Sabukwe. Nevertheless, his legacy lives on. Nah, that was fire, bro. That was a good documentary. That was fire. Yeah. Well, y'all, that was a lot. <laughs> um, I wish he was one of those people that we learned about, but, you know. I feel like there's so much more to that late. story, too. Bro. Right. It's so never late to learn new things and about new people. So, do we have any monuments or anything that we, like, landmarks that we need to be aware of? You know, we would love to visit them. And let mm -hmm. us know about his family. Yeah. You know, their contributions to society now. Um, yeah. Just let us know. Yeah. So, we hope you guys enjoyed this video with us. Like this video. Subscribe. Turn on the post notification bell. We have enabled our super, super thanks. thanks. If you like, support the channel that way. As well as our reaction request form is in our description, description box below. below. We'll see you soon. Peace.